Good, good evening. So let's continue. Let's talk about the cardiomyopathy's definition and classification. The, we know that uh, f f long years ago, from long years ago, that there is uh, some things something, some disease behind the uh, coronary artery disease. And the term of cardiomyopathy was defined uh, earlier in uh, 1957. And you see that, uh, first of all, they defined th three subtypes with, based on the phenotype, dilated, hypertrophic, and restrictive. And uh, from 74 to uh, 96, the definition did not change a lot. But uh, a lot of progress has been made based on specifically on the genetic characterization of those disease. And that picture uh, showed you that the picture is really complicated and some gene could give two different phenotypes. For example, that gene could give a dilated phenotype and an hypertrophic phenotype. And uh, um, all those uh, disease, some of those disease might be intricated. And um, so we have to define the phenotype, of course, but also the genotype of the disease. And a lot of progress has been made also in genetic characterization. We, we saw that uh, biomarkers, imaging drugs, uh, prevention, uh, treat with the defibrillator, the possibility to implant a defibrillator, and surgery. So um, the, oh, an older classification from the AHF uh, back to um, 2006 talk about, the, of course, the a phenotype here, but also from the origin, classified the uh, disease based on the or origin of the disease, genetic mixed acquired. And a, a, a more recent uh, classification include also with the phenotype the, um, the etiology of the disease. But a new uh, classification uh, came, uh, came up in 2013 with the MOGES classification based on the TNM classification, the, the same uh, uh, system as the TNM classification. And uh, the cardiomyopathy are disorders characterized by morphologically and functionally abnormal myocardium in the absence of any other disease that is sufficient by itself to cause the observed phenotype. And it works as TNM, as I said. So the first, the first letter for MOGES is M, morphofunctional. So this is the phenotype. And you can define dilated, hypertrophic, restrictive, uh, mainly involving the right ventricle. After you have to classify the O from organ involvement. So for example, heart, of course, skeletal muscle, brain, and so and so. After we'll talk about the genetic or familial inheritance, autosomal dominant, recessive, X-linked, and so and so. Etiological, it could be genetic, of course, but it could be also toxic sarcoid disease based on uh, sarcoid disease or other um, uh, autoimmune disease or infectious and so on and so. And also one important marker is the S sign, which is this heart failure stages. Because some of our patients are known to have the disease but are, uh, have, are asymptomatic. So to date, this is not possible. Before that classification, it was not possible to include them and to uh, uh, tell them that they have a real cardiomyopathy. And now this is possible with that new classification. You can enter patient with um, asymptomatic patient in that classification. So you can upload a um, uh, smartphone app to define your patient and to characterize your patient. And you see that there is a specific uh, description for the, each subtype of the classification. And it's not possible to go over all the disease, of, over all the etiology of the cardiomyopathy. So I have to restrain my talk to three main topics of the cardiomyopathy, hypertrophic, arrhythmogenic right ventricle dysplasia, and dilated cardiomyopathy. So sorry for those shortcut, but... Um, Let's talk about the hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So M, it's the unexplained LV wall thickening. And uh, usually the heart is involved, but it's non-sarcomeric form of the hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. The involvement could be systemic. Uh, 
usually it's a gene encoding uh, proteins from of the sarcomere. Here you saw the sarcomere, so a lot of protein could be involved and could give an hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And this is the most common genetic cardiomyopathy. So this is the most common genetic, and there is also non-sarcomeric etiologies, and this are mainly differential diagnoses of the disease like Fabry and Denon disease. Um, it could be genetic, but it could also, the hypertrophy could also be due to other etiology than, than genetic, and it's mainly the differential diagnosis of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, such as amyloidosis, sarcoidosis, or some of toxic etiology. So when MR could help in the characterization of that disease, probably in the diagnosis, in the definition of the obstruction and the prognosis also. So how to define uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy? The, the, the phenotype of the disease is characterized by, is very really precise, precisely characterized by maximal LV wall thickness higher than 15 millimeter. So, and the wall thickness in between 13 to 14 millimeter are borderline, and you have to implement other um, factors to uh, define, to precise the etiology familial history of HCM. On, uh, in children, the wall thickness should be uh, measured in, uh, based on the, uh, the mean, the normal value of the mean due, uh, based on the age of the children. And the HCM require also exclusion of other disease and exclusion of dilated LV chamber and another cardiac or systemic disease that could capable of producing hypertrophy. So the distribution of the hypertrophy uh, is, uh, could be very different, and usually it's asymmetric. And some form uh, uh, are predominant at the septum. Some form involve the thickness is mainly involving the anterior wall. In some form, this is myocardial involvement, and in some form, this is an apical involvement. So all those patterns uh, are uh, due to the same disease, the hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. The, mainly the septal form is uh, predominant. But in some, uh, one third of the patients, the, it's, the hypertrophy is localized on a small portion of the, uh, of the LV. And the phenotype is based on the measurement of the maximal LV thickness, but that measurement should be performed in, at the end diastolic phase. You should avoid to measure the trabeculation of the LV chamber or the right ventricle or trabeculation, of course. And to, you have to avoid partial volume effect, so you have to measure that in a short axis slice. So, um, 80 year old male soccer player is systematic medical workup before a competition that is used in uh, that. It's the healthcare policy in France. And uh, on EKG, there is inferior negative T wave. And on US, no evidence of hypertrophy. Could, do you think that the normal ultrasound is sufficient to exclude HCM or an MR should be performed to confirm the diagnosis of HCM? Could we have the results? Of course, this is a, I will show you why. Uh, this is the, the patient is here. So the ultrasound was strictly normal, but you see that on MR, you can depict an obvious hypertrophy of the myocardium, but that hypertrophy is located at the basal part of the anterior wall of the, uh, of the myocardium. So this is a, uh, that area is, might be really difficult to assess using ultrasound due to, the, um, due to proximity with the lung and the partial volume effect that, is, uh, that could be seen uh, with ultrasound. So MR 
uh, is known to depict form of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy that is not uh, accessible using ultrasound. Furthermore, using late gadolinium enhancement, we can depict small area, small spots of late gadolinium enhancement in the most thickened part of the myocardium. And this is well known. We know that uh, around roughly 10% of the hypertrophic cardiomyopathy are, could not be depicted using ultrasound just due to the uh, location of the hypertrophy. If the hypertrophy is located at the most basal part of the anterior wall of the LV or at the apical part of the LV, it might be difficult to depict those locations using um, ultrasound due to um, uh, eco um, window or a lung, uh, because ultrasound could depict nicely the interface between the cavity and the endocardial and the wall, but it's much more difficult to define the epicardial wall. Another important stuff for the diagnosis uh, of the hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is the presence of crip, crips. Crips are that form, that type of invagination of the cavity within the LV wall. And when there are numerous higher than two, and located at the anterior or lateral wall that could advocate the diagnosis. And there are predominance in the genetic positive, but without any phenotype. Though you, can, you could depict those scripts in patients that you are explored, uh, that patients that are relatives to a patient with real hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So if you explore the first relative, uh, the first degree relative of a patient with real cardiomyopathy, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, you have to look for CRIPS that could advocate for the diagnosis before the um, uh, hypertrophy, before the apparition of the hypertrophy. A case of a patient that was referred because uh, he was a highly trained athlete, uh, but the ultrasound depict uh, LV thickness at 15 millimeter on ultrasound. He was referred for, uh, to MR for the assessment of, the, um, of that hypertrophy and to uh, define what kind of hypertrophy the patient uh, uh, have. You see, that this is a really homogeneous hypertrophy located in all the segments of the myocardium, and uh, the wall thickness is homogeneous and increased in all the segments of the myocardium. You think that this is an hypertrophic cardiomyopathy? Could it, could it be a lead heart, or you don't know, you need further information. Okay, could we get the results? Very good. Of course, we need, there, there is in the literature some criteria that could separate athlete heart and hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Athlete heart is the modification linked to physical activity. If you increase your activity, you will modify your, uh, ph the physiology of your heart due to uh, uh, training. And it arises if you are doing more than 10 hours of exercise a week. So below that level, it could, you could not measure, you could not assess um, modification or remodeling uh, due to physical activity. Uh, the physical activity give you, gives you an homogeneous hypertrophy, interesting all the segment of the LV wall. There is no more LV filling on cardiac ultrasound. There is no familial history of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And the treatment exercise will be normal with a normal oxygen consumption. Sometimes this is really difficult to separate the physical activity remodeling the, or remodeling linked with physical activity and hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So you're pushed to, um, uh, to uh, ask the patient to deconditioning, to, to stop all the physical activity and to redo MR several one or two months after the stop of the physical activity. You have to reassess 
the 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 cardiac MR, and if it's still hypertrophic, it's more prone to be an hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. It's usually physical activity, the remodeling linked to physical activity decreased after a period of deconditioning. MR could be help could help uh, for differential diagnosis of uh, such disease. A uh, 60 year old male, no um, disease history referred to MR after a ultrasound for obstructive cardiomyopathy. You see that there is a huge hypertrophy here, interesting all the segments of the myocardium, the lateral in uh, late enhancement, and a low T1 value, a low native T1 value, really below the normal value of the T1, uh, of the native T1, just before uh, injection. What is your diagnosis? Hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, fab Fabry disease, amyloid disease, myocarditis, mitochondrial cardiomyopathy. So that case could illustrate the potential of MR to assess the uh, differential diagnosis of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and disease linked with um, Not bad, but it was a Fabry disease. The Fabry is the uh, storage disease caused by the accumulation of fat in the myocardial cell. Or fat, you know that fat has low T1. So if you measure the T1 by T1 mapping, the value of the, in the myocardium will be decreased. So the Fabry disease will give a decrease of the T1, native T1 value. So this could be an interesting application of the T1 map in clinical practice. So this is a, as a, as a, and you can confirm the diagnosis using really an, a, a quick screening test on, with using, using dried blood. And you can also, this uh, disease could be treated by enzymatic treatment, so you can uh, sub substitute the, defic the uh, defic deficiency of the uh, alpha galactosidase activity. For the obstruction, the, this is a complex process linked with the hypertrophy of the septum and the abnormality of the mitral valve. So in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, the mitral valve could be increased, the length of the mitral valve could be increased. And if the length of the um, anterior leaflet is higher than 30 millimeter, it could advocate the diagnosis. It's part of the phenotype. It's not included in the uh, recommendation for the diagnosis, but it's part of the phenotype of the hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So a length of the anterior uh, mitral leaflet higher than 30 millimeter could be a nice um, um, hint for the diagnosis of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. But the obstruction will be defined using ultrasound. The obstruction, the, the, the definition of the obstruction and indication to treat the patient will be based on the results of the ultrasound. MR will not give you interesting results uh, and not without any sufficient reproducibility and uh, precision to uh, base your definition on that. But you can help in defining where is the, op the um, obstruction. Does it caused by the mitral abnormality or does it is it due to mainly the hypertrophy of the septum? Sudden cardiac death. This is a case of a patient that experienced a sudden cardiac death. He was resuscitated and he was uh, sent to our department to uh, exploration. And you see that there is a huge hypertrophy of the septum with a clear late gain enhancement of in the septum wall. And we know that that late GATA enhancement match with area of fibrosis in the myocardium. And a lot of investigators look at the link between late GATA enhancement and arrhythmic events and uh, sudden cardiac death. But to date, there is no clear information and there is no clear recommendation 
uh, on the based on the link uh, between the late GATT enhancement and the risk of sudden cardiac death. There is a clear link with uh, uh, um, heart failure death and the presence of late GATT enhancement, but there is not clear link, no clear link with the, based on the link uh, with a sudden cardiac death. So probably it's because we are not measuring the right parameter. And uh, that paper is showing that the extracellular volume based on the measurement uh, with T1 mapping before and after GAD enhancement will probably bring new insight in the knowledge of uh, the hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and the knowledge of the, uh, and the prediction of the uh, sudden cardiac in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. There is a lot of ongoing study uh, using T1 mapping pre- and post-contrast with ECV quantification to assess the sudden cardiac risk because, prob because with late GAN enhancement, we did not find, we did not found any interesting results and that was not included in recommendation to, for assessment of sudden cardiac death. Another uh, clinical form of uh, hypertrophic at risk in that form was uh, exclusion chamber of the left ventricle wall. You see that there is an exclusion chamber with another aneurysm of the LV apex here with large uh, late GAD enhancement in the, uh, in the apex. That form of the disease it is at risk. We know that that ap apical ballooning and apical aneurysm is linked with 10% of cardiac events a year. So this is really high rate of events. And furthermore, 15% of those apical aneurysm could not be assessed using ultrasound just due to the same um, reason as uh, the hypertrophy could, no, uh, could not be assessed using ultrasound just because of the uh, chest wall and the proximity with the chest wall. So um, there is a recommendation to assess the risk, and uh, now the, there is a score calculator with linear risk calculation. This is, and you can uh, upload also that risk score calculation on the ESC uh, um, uh, platform, and to just define the risk of your patients. So H HCM is a frequent disease, the first cause of sudden death in young competitive athletes. And the definition, definition of the disease is based on the LV wall thickness higher than the cutoff value of 15 millimeter. And the normal cardiac ultrasound uh, with an explained rep, repolarization abnormality could not exclude the HGM. And CMR is the best alternative to ultrasound for the diagnosis. For arrhythmogenic right ventricular dysplasia, uh, this is also this this is a disease characterized by fibrophaty replacement of the RV and also LV wall, involving um, predominantly the uh, inflow tract, the outflow tract, and the RV apex. This is a potential risk for thoracic cardiac death, but also RV heart failure. The Mainly the heart is involved, but in systemic, could the, if the origin is not genetic, uh, the involvement could be systemic if it's other diagnosis than genetic disorder. And uh, also Sarkoid disease and myocarditis sequela could give you uh, exactly the same phenotype of uh, those disease, of arrhythmogenic right ventricular dysplasia. So um, new, uh, new. That's that's not new. But the last classification, the last recommendation for the diagnosis include MR as a, 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 a exam that could measure the f um, morphology of the alvea that could f look for um, a p parameter for the diagnosis criteria for the diagnosis of right ventricular uh, arrhythmogenic uh, dysplasia. And on MR, the, the, those criteria are based on akinesia or dyskinesia and uh, RV uh, and diastolic volume higher than uh, um, a value and RV ejection uh, decrease. It could be uh, major or minor criteria depending on the value that you retain and the value that you get for the measurements. <clears throat> 
But those uh, uh, right ventricular assessment is really difficult because the uh, RV normality, abnormality, is probably one of the most difficult part of cardiac MR. There is a lot of variability in uh, right ventricular shape, and this is really difficult to define normality and abnormality. So you have to train, and the um, learning curve is really long learning curve is really a long period of training to assess the normality of right ventricle. And, uh, and furthermore, this, there is a high variability in that structure. There is a lot of artifact between every wall and the chest wall, and uh, publications are made by trained team, and uh, there is also a low prevalence of arrhythmogenic right ventricular dysplasia, and a lot of cases, a lot of patients that are suspected to have arrhythmogenic right ventricular dysplasia. So first you have to begin with a, um, a, a correct uh, protocol, uh, imaging protocol, short axis for volume or an RV ejection fraction assessment. You have to cover the RV free wall uh, using four chamber view. You have to define an uh, infinibulum view or VOT view, and probably you have to assess the T1, uh, the fat uh, using T1 TSA with double inversion recovery, uh, and you can else also assess late enhancement. You might have extra systole uh, during the exam, and uh, in my experience, this is not in recommendation, but in my experience, with, no, with extra ventricle or extra systole, to decrease the number of ventricle extra systole, you can inject atropine. This is not an antiarrhythmic drug, but it could increase the heart rate and it will decrease the frequency of the extra systole, uh, ventricle or extra systole. But this is my experience. So after you have to properly define the volume, RV volume, which is not a simple part of the exam. So I recommend you to go over the STMR recommendation for, for processing. This is an online paper, and they will show you how to define the limits of the right ventricle in diastole and in systole, just to get proper numbers. I talked to you about artifact. Look at that. This is an artifact. This is the dark cream here is not an anatomical structure. This is just an artifact between the fat and the proton, including the fat, and the proton, including water, or uh, things that look like water, that, I mean, blood and uh, LV, RV wall. And you see that there is the, those dark cream is um, um, surrounded the limits between fat and water. Here there is no dark rim because this is only uh, uh, the proton are in the, there is no fat in that structure. But in, in between the fat and the water, you will find on those um, um, steady state reposition sequences that dark rim. But in between here in the chest wall, next to the chest wall, next to the fat of the under skin fat, next to the uh, bone, here there is bone, there is muscle, there is uh, hair here in the lung, and there is, that could create artifact in between the right ventricle wall and that dark rim. And you see that, that dark rim do not match with the anatomical structure of the right ventricle. If you just adapt the frequency scoot, you can remove that artifact. So just be careful of that sign, of that images. That dark rim is an artifact. This is not an anatomical structure. And that artifact arises at the apex of the right ventricle, often. And the, the other really difficult part is to define what is hypokinesia, akinesia, or dyskinesia of the right ventricle, because there is not a lot of case of arrhythmogenic right ventricle dysplasia, and it's not easy to find any abnormal right ventricle. So I showed you, I selected for you uh, several images, several cases that, to my point of view, could advocate all those diagnoses, all those uh, signs. So here, you see that there is the basal wall, and the, the basal wall, there is a, not a lot of uh, kinetics in the basal wall. So the kinetics here is decreased, but there is kinetics here, there is kinesia here, but here there is no contraction. 
So this is uh, uh, the akinesia is defined as a systolic wall thickening lower than 10%. This is this is really diff a difficult definition, but this is the only definition that I found in the literature. So there is no kinetics, no motion here, and this is could be considered as an akinesia, which is part of the diagnosis, part of the criteria for the diagnosis. Look at that area in the infinibulum here and the basal wall here. You see that there is a bulging here, and there is a bulging here, there's a bulging here. Could be considered as dyskinesia, myocardial segment which move outward in systole. And there is an outward motion during systole here, here, and here. Okay, this is typical from right ventricular dysplasia. Another uh, definition is the right ventricle aneurysm, this segment with persistent bulging in diastole and dyskinetic in systole. Here, there is a dilatation in diastole and there is a dyskinesia in systole. Okay? Everybody gets it. RV dilatation, you see here there is a huge uh, right ventricle dilatation here, and all oh, interesting, all the right ventricle here, another case here with the huge dilatation of the right ventricle and the right atria here. Fatty infiltration, that criteria is not included in the recent task force criteria for the diagnosis. So we should not base our diagnosis on the presence of fat infiltration in our, um, uh, uh, in our uh, cases. But you see that this is really difficult to assess the fat infiltration. Why? Because the fat infiltration goes from the epicardial fat and goes toward the endocardium. So the difference between the normal epicardial fat and the fatty infiltration in the myocardium is really, really difficult to make. So you can find such images with the invagination of the fat within the myocardium, but this is really, might be really difficult to define. So this is not anymore included in the recommendation criteria. Late get enhancement, this is the same story, not included in the recommendation and the task force criteria for the diagnosis, but you could assess that if, and in our experience, we assess that only if we found any kinetics abnormality of the wall, of the RV wall, we will assess the, the late gain enhancement and to find, to define the presence of late gain enhancement in that wall. But it, this is, again, not anymore included in the criteria for the diagnosis. So, oh, sorry. I selected for you three cases with right ventricle or abnormal kinesia. I would like you to look at those three cases and to tell me which one is the arrhythmogenic right ventricle or dysplasia. Here there is a um, dip atrial ventricle or sulcus. You see the fat is, uh, the, the, the sulcus in, is in, in present, really present, and the sulcus is really deep. And there is, for, um, um, if, more than that, there is a right bundle block branch. So there is an aspect of late contraction of the right ventricle compared to the left ventricle. But this is, this is not an arrhythmogenic right ventricle dysplasia. This one is a pulmonary hypertension with a communication uh, in between the two atrium here. And here, it was the real arrhythmogenic right ventricle dysplasia. That patient, the diagnosis was based on the familial history and EKG. Just to tell you that the diagnosis of arrhythmogenic right ventricle dysplasia is not based only on MR results. It's a multifactorial diagnosis. So you have to pay attention on on your uh, report and to just talk with the, red, the cardiologist who send you the patient just to see if there is other diagnosis than the morphological abnormality that you found just to, uh, to make your diagnosis. So it might be really difficult to define uh, and just 
keep on your abnormality and the abnormality that you uh, assess and you measure. You see that there is here, there is no criteria for the diagnosis. The right ventricle was normal, the agitation fraction was strictly normal, and there is no akinesia or dyskinesia of the right free wall. But there, there were other diagnoses that uh, are su sufficient to uh, set the diagnosis. Here, a uh, case here of uh, a diagnosis that could mimic arrhythmogic right ventricle dysplasia. There is a huge deviation of the heart, but asymptomatic patient. And if you look at the CT scan, you see that there is no, there is a defect on the pericardium. This is a, a partial pericardial defect, okay, that causes you a, a, right, a left deviation of the heart. So acquisition protocol should be performed completely. Learning curve is difficult. And describe your finding and imaging criteria and keep on that. But be very careful on your conclusion. Keep in mind that the diagnosis of AR, IRVD is based on the several other criteria than MRI and work closely with your cardiologist. So the phenotype of the dilated cardiomyopathies could be uh, sporadic, and a lot of disease could, could uh, uh, um, uh, give uh, to dilated uh, myocardial, uh, dilated cardiomyopathy, myocarditis, toxic, autoimmune, metabolic disorder, or genetic disorder. The definition of the dilated the, the phenotype is based on measurements and the presence of uh, left ventricle dilatation and left ventricle systolic dysfunction. I recommend you also to uh, refer to the SCMR recommendation for volume, LV volume, and mass, because all the measurements are, uh, all the measure, all the um, uh, numbers are based on your measurements. So this is really important to get really a nice and a precise way to measure volume and ejection fraction. First of all, to define what is normal, what is abnormal. The same story, but with a competitive athlete tri triathlon experience lipotemia and the ejection fraction was low and the, di the diagnosis of dilated cardiometry was advocated. Oh, sorry. And uh, um, the, based on that, you can also find diagnosis that could separate the uh, athlete horror from dilated cardiomyopathy. Uh, um, intense physical activity could give hypertrophy, but it could also give dilatation of the myocardium. Depend on what type of exercise you are doing. Endurance exercises are more prone to give dilatation of the myocardium. So you can define the, the normality if you can, you can see a rem a remodeling due to physical activity if the activity is higher than 10 hours of endurance exercise a week, normal LV feeling on cardiac ultrasound, no familial history of dietary cardiomyopathy, no tr uh, normal treatment exercise, and normal response to uh, uh, deconditioning also. What is the first cause of left ventricle or ejection fraction decrease? Cardiomyopathy, ischemic disorder, hypertension, diabetes, toxic. Could we have the results? No results. This is ischemic disorder. In two thirds of the case, the systemic disorder, the ischemic disorder, um, are, are the first etiology of left ventricular ejection decrease. So, if we are talking about cardiomyopathy, we, first you will find decrease in ejection fraction. So, you first. Your first goal is to look for a coronary artery disease. And when you know that um, uh, more than half of the patient will have an abnormal spect in case of LV dilatation and dysfunction, you know that you probably have to go directly over an anatomic assessment of the coronary artery, of the coronary anatomy. And here, the uh, CT scan is probably the best tool to assess the coronary anatomy. 
And uh, so a, a lot of patients, more than 50% uh, of the dilated cardiomyopathy are from genetic origin. So we will talk about a little bit of uh, those genetic uh, origin. As the phenotype is dilated, might be associated with muscular, muscular disorder or neuro disorder. This is atomic dominant and 50% and of familial origin. The difficult part with the genetic origin is that Sorry. Difficult part of the genetic origin is that uh, you see the genetic testing is positive in thir only 30 percent, okay, and the result might took six months to one year, okay, depending on what you are asking for, and you have to explore the first degree relatives of the patient that you are diagnosed and that are that are suspected to have a genetic uh, origin of the disease. And the expression of the gene is variable. So you can have people with the genetic abnormality and that are unaffected by the disease, and it could go over the heart transplantation, the need for heart transplantation, transplantation for other people with the same gene. So the expression is really variable through the people. And for us, some of example, Duchenne Becker dystrophy. This is uh, uh, this linked with the abnormality of the a protein of the cerebral membrane. It's uh, higher, 7% uh, of the familial form. It goes give that picture of linked with m more prone to uh, look uh, more prone to uh, look like myocarditis here, uh, but the prognosis of that disease is linked with the prognosis of the heart, the heart involvement. Another mutation, the lamin mutation, this is the typical form of dilated cardiomyopathy. There is no specific sign of symptoms on MR that could advocate a diagnosis. But you, you have to know that that form, that lamin mutation, is linked with high incidence of severe arrhythmia. And uh, a lot of patients with that abnormality died from sudden cardiac death. Another atypical diagnosis. So look at that cases. What is your diagnosis? You see there is a dilated left ventricle and dilated right ventricle. There's probably an, a thrombus in the apex of the myocardium. Could, be, could it be dilated cardiomyopathy, ischemic cardiomyopathy, left ventricle and compaction, not sure, mitral failure. Of course, this is a left ventricle non compaction disease. The definition of the ventricle non compaction is uh, difficult in literature, and uh, we try to define and uh, we're trying to define new parameter that could uh, measure the trabeculation, not only based on one measurement on one segment with a linear definition of the non compacted and compacted. We define, uh, the, the, uh, we quantify the mass, the total mass of the uh, non compacted LV mass and the mass including the trabeculation. And by uh, subtraction, we can uh, calculate the percent of trabeculated LV mass. And we know that ma that uh, percent of trabeculated LV mass is really interesting to specif um, uh, sensitive and specific for the diagnosis of left ventricle lung compaction. We're in the process of providing a free software for automatic quantification of such trabeculation. And the first paper about that uh, was uh, about that software was published recently. So it will be accessible and free um, for definition of the left ventricle and compaction. There is also another parameter that could define the diagnosis of left ventricle and compaction uh, by fractal analysis. But probably the main problem is what is the prognosis of this disease? To date, there is no modification of the prognosis based on left ventricle, the quantity of the left ventricle or trabeculation uh, measured in the left ventricle. So the, uh, in those patients, the prognosis is, was linked with left ventricle fraction and late gadolinium enhancements. So it uh, probably more 
work are needed to define what is a, f a bad prognosis in those patients. Another case important, um, because this is non-genetic etiology, but the MR could help in the diagnosis of such disease. 38-year-old uh, triathlete, uh, recent onset of dyspnea, and it was referred on uh, MR to define the, the uh, phenotype of the disease. You see that the dilated phenotype, but the late gut enhancement is really atypical for late gut enhancement and for the dilated cardiomyopathy. And you see that there is a huge uh, involvement of the myocardium. Um, and uh, it was a, a sarcoidosis. And we send the patient to the CT scan, and you look at the, in the lung, there is a lot of involvement of the uh, lung, and it was uh, with a lymph, lymph node in the, in the mediastinum and in the high uh, right and left ventricle lung. T2 map could help in the definition of the uh, disease also, especially for the quantification of edema. And in dilated cardiomyopathy, this was the T2 value was the only uh, parameter that could advocate that could uh, uh, advocate the uh, f uh, for the chronic myocarditis. You know that uh, myocarditis could be an etiology of the dilated cardiomyopathy. And today, there is no way to define what kind of patient is the in what kind of patient the dilated cardiomyopathy is, is due to a, a myocarditis. And T2 might be the, the, uh, the parameter that we have to measure to define in what kind of patient the dilated cardiomyopathy will be due to a chronic myocarditis. So it will be interesting to measure that. For prognosis, we know that that form of late gut enhancement in the septum is of worse prognosis, and it was defined in several studies as well as in meta-analysis. We know that the presence of late gut enhancement in the septum is of bad prognosis of our, for our patient with dilated cardiomyopathy, independently of other parameter and more than left ventricular ejection fraction. So it's really interesting to assess late GAD enhancement here. And native T1 is also of really great use in dilated cardiomyopathy. It seems to be also a really nice prognosis marker, uh, um, even more than late ventricular contraction and late GAD enhancement. And you see that the, uh, when the native T1 is lower than normal value, is higher, sorry, is higher than normal value, the prognosis is worse. And if the T1 value is normal, the prognosis is uh, roughly good. And so that will be, the T1 native T1 is uh, probably, will be an interesting marker in the future to assess the prognosis. So uh, uh, the fibrosis process in dilated cardiomyopathy is diffuse and more, it will be more accessible using T1, native T1 mapping and ECV quantification. And this it is a valuable tool to assess coronary anatomy. And quantification of dilated of uh, fibrosis will be probably a next future marker for prognosis. T1, T2, and ECV quantification are really important to assess in those disease. And you know that with T1, you can characterize tissue, but also with T2, T2 mapping, you can add other information in the characterization of the tissue. Thank you for your attention.